Welcome to Green Lake. We are so glad to have those of you that were able to make it in person and those watching online. And it is my privilege to welcome John Pauline. I was able to pick him up from the airport today and get to know a little bit about him and his family and have dinner tonight. And John Pauline is the professor of religion at Loma Linda University. And he has served there from 2007 to 2019. And he also served as dean of the School of Religion. Prior to his time in Loma Linda, he was professor of New Testament interpretation at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. His education includes a Bachelor of Arts degree from Atlantic Union College and an MDiv and PhD from Andrews University. Prior to obtaining his doctoral degree, he was a Seventh-day Adventist church pastor in New York City. He is the author of more than 30 books and more than 200 articles. Studies, among others, in, in scholarly papers of Society of Biblical Literature, Chicago Society for Biblical Research, and others and other publications. John is a specialist in the study of the Johannian literature in the New Testament Gospel of John and Book of Revelation, an intersection of faith with contemporary culture. He also takes a special delight in seminars and presentations to non-specialists who make a practical use of material in the real world. When not at work, John enjoys being with his wife, Pamela, their three children, and two spouses, and their two grandchildren. He also enjoys travel, golf, and photography when time permits. It's my privilege to welcome John Pauline. So Dr. Pauline, please come forward, and the time is yours. Go ahead. I do have to ask, Pastor, did you say I had two spouses? <laughs> I just want everyone to know that isn't true. <laughs> I have one wife uh, for about 48 years now, and uh, very grateful for that. Uh, not super familiar with Seattle, but I do have some early history here uh, because my parents brought me here for the Seattle World's Fair back in 1962 when the Space Needle was brand new. So I have just a little bit of history back then. I've been back a couple of times uh, more recently uh, for a couple of uh, things I did up in Bellingham. Uh, in any case, if you don't mind, I thought I'd start with my favorite uh, Seattle joke. And it goes something like this. You have a Texan. You've probably heard this, right? You've had a Texan, an Alaskan, and somebody who lives here in Seattle. And two of them said to the Texan, you know, it's so hot down there. How can you stand living there? And the Texan said, oh, it's a dry heat. It doesn't really bother us. And then two of them turned to the Alaskan and said, it's so cold up there. How can you stand living there? And the Alaskan said, yeah, it's cold, but uh, it's a dry cold. It doesn't really bother us. So then they turned to the guy from Seattle. And they says, it's always raining there. How can you stand living in a place like that? Yeah, it rains a lot, but it's a dry rain. And it doesn't really bother us. <laughs> so that was uh, one of my introductions uh, to Seattle. I uh, had a chance uh, to get together on Zoom with a few of the uh, leaders of the church here. And uh, what type of program shall we uh, do this weekend? And uh, the most popular idea was to talk more deeply about the cosmic conflict in Scripture and what that is. And I think this is a subject that is really relevant when you take a closer look. The topic for tonight is when atonement isn't enough. When you think of the word atonement, uh, that's what we usually use to talk about how God reconciles people to himself. That's what the whole idea of atonement is in the Bible. But tonight, we're gonna say, are there times when atonement isn't enough? And I think that that is true, and we'll explain as we go along. Ultimately, this is all about the problem of suffering and the problem of evil. If you've ever lost somebody suddenly that was really close to you, if you ever spent your whole life just uh, being very, very attentive to your health, to eating right and so on, and then you develop cancer. At times like that, people ask, 
Why? If God is good and God is powerful, why do people suffer? Why is there so much evil in the world? And there are actually a number of explanations that people attempt, and I'll share those with you just briefly today. We teach a whole class in this at Loma Linda University for the medical students uh, that uh, they can be prepared to address these issues when it comes up with patients. And one of them is, it's part of God's plan. God knows what he's doing. He knows what's best. He planned for you to suffer, so just deal with it. It's going to be okay in the long run. It's part of the plan. And many people find that tremendously comforting. If you're familiar with uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, uh, the girl that uh, was paralyzed from the neck down since the age of 19. She's a strong believer in that. She says, I just believe that I was meant to be there that day. I was meant to have this illness. Right? That's really helpful to a lot of people, but not to everybody. There may be some of you cringing right now. So let's try another one. Uh, the second one is blame it on freedom. God created us free. And we screwed it up. Okay? So it isn't God's plan that you're suffering. It's the result of human choices. Maybe not your choice, but the choice of the human race uh, to be where we are. And a lot of people find that a very comforting uh, explanation, but not everybody. A third option is it helps us learn and grow. Uh, you know, we are so dense, we're so stubborn, that unless we suffered a little bit, we'd never ever get better. That God gets our attention, and, and God teaches us through suffering. And that can be very comforting to many people and infuriating to others. Then, it's a spillover of the cosmic conflict. There's a universal war going on and every planet and every nation and every person is involved in that battle in some way. And suffering is one of the collateral damage kinds of things that happens in a war. Innocent people sometimes suffer. And the explanation is that God is engaged in this cosmic conflict. And that's why people suffer even though God does not desire it. A fifth explanation is that suffering occurs because there's limitations in God's knowledge. And by the way, all of these you can find in the Bible somewhere. All right? So it's not like one is right and the other is wrong. They're all in the Bible, one place or another. And the idea that there are some limitations to God's knowledge. And uh, that might be a counterintuitive one for some of you and we'll uh, leave that for another time. Another one is limits to God's power. If you've heard of the book, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, now I can't come up with a title. It's a very famous book. Harold Kushner was the author, but it has to do with when good people suffer. You know, why is that? And his basic uh, which many Jewish people have come to after the Holocaust, God would have intervened if he could, but for some reason he couldn't. There are limits to God's power. And then finally, the seventh one is the angry one. Suffering makes no sense, and the only sensible thing to do is protest. And you say, well, how can that be in the Bible until you remember that Jesus on the cross said what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus protested at that point. He was, uh, he was sensing that something very terrible was happening, and it wasn't his fault. So protest uh, is one way that people address the issue of evil and suffering. The only one of these, though, that requires the Bible is uh, the one on cosmic conflict. We probably wouldn't have gone to cosmic conflict if it wasn't in the Bible. It's, it, it can be detailed and, and difficult to understand at times. 
But Seventh-day Adventists, with the help of Ellen G. White, have come to find in this the most explanatory power when it comes to these issues of suffering. The others, uh, people can just come to, I think, as a personal philosophy. You know, a lot of people just say, well, everything in my life was planned by God, so why should I complain? You know, and it just comes natural to people. But the cosmic conflict is not something we probably would have come up with on our own. So, I remember a time when I was... Uh, involved in a television show in the Los Angeles area, and there was this Jewish gal doing makeup. And uh, for some reason, I just asked her the question, do you ever feel like there's a war going on inside of your head? And she said, all the time. All the time. And that's what I think the biblical concept of a cosmic conflict it's not just something that's out there. It's something that's in here as well. It affects every detail of our lives. But Adventists didn't come up with this. It wasn't invented by Ellen White. It's actually an early church father, Origen of Alexandria, is the first person that seems to have clearly articulated the idea, a cosmic conflict between God and Satan, a conflict over the character of God, over the government of God. Uh, Origin of Alexandria uh, was one that brought that out fairly clearly, and he was about 200 to 250 A.D., so about 200 years after the cross. You have a Christian theologian articulating this idea with great clarity. Surprise. The second major place you'll find it is the Quran. How it got there, of course, we can, we can uh, speculate. But the Quran probably has the clearest description of the heavenly conflict outside of the writings of Ellen White. And uh, that, for me, was an exciting discovery uh, when I read it through. Then there is, of course, Dante. Dante's Inferno and stuff. And all of that, uh, he showed quite an understanding of this theme. Then later on was John Milton in the 1600s, and he wrote uh, a famous poem called Paradise Lost. Ellen White had that book in her library. She loved this. She studied it uh, a great deal, and it seems that Milton, uh, his language had an influence on the way she told that story. A contemporary of Ellen White was Henry Melville, and he was the pastor at Westminster Abbey where they have the, the royal coronations uh, for kings and queens uh, in England. And he had a very clear concept of the cosmic conflict, and Ellen White often echoes his language. She had studied uh, Melville uh, during this time as well. And then, of course, there is Ellen G. White, and as I've said, probably the clearest expression of the cosmic conflict uh, is in her writings. And then, closer to our time, C.S. Lewis clearly understood this. And also his English literature friend, J.R.R. Tolkien. If you're not familiar with that name, he's the author of Lord of the Rings, which is a cosmic conflict theme uh, in fantasy. And these were both uh, Christians uh, who had a clear knowledge of the Bible and uh, used their knowledge to write uh, fiction to try to reach uh, secular people with it. And then contemporary Gregory Boyd is not a Seventh-day Adventist, but uh, his teaching is as clear as uh, C.S. Lewis and a uh, very powerful expression of this whole thing. So the question is, and let me just back up just a second, just to ask you the question to think about. What is the biggest text in the Bible? You know, just think about it. What would you say is the text in the Bible that is the most cosmic in scope? One would think maybe Revelation 12 uh, or Revelation 20, but I think there's another text that is even more comprehensive than that, and that is Ephesians chapter 1. And this is where I like to start 
and the cosmic conflict in Scripture. Because the Apostle Paul takes this huge view in Ephesians 1. In fact, this entire text, Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14, is one sentence in the original language. And in fact, it doesn't even have a main verb. Paul is just spilling uh, one clause after another as he's trying to express uh, something about God. Here's the main sentence. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word be isn't even in the original. It's just understood. Blessed God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So this text goes up to the highest heaven, goes all the way back into eternity, before the creation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So this text goes way, way back and way, way up. Then notice the ending of this long sentence. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So here the same text looks infinitely into the future, into eternity, when we receive the inheritance from God our, of our eternal life. So this text in Ephesians goes from eternity past to eternity future, and from the highest heaven, but it doesn't go below. One reason people don't often see this text as part of the cosmic conflict is because it doesn't talk about it. It doesn't talk about Satan. It doesn't talk about an enemy. It doesn't talk about sin. It doesn't talk about uh, the, the brokenness of the universe. But look what it does say. In the middle, it gives God's purpose for the whole thing. So this text is the most comprehensive statement of what is God doing in the universe, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. What's God's plan? To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things in earth. The highest, most comprehensive purpose in the universe is unity, to bring everything together. And this word, all things, in the Greek language is tapanta, which is the Greek word for the universe. Cosmos is also a Greek word, but it actually means the earth. Tapanta is the everything. If any of you have a German background, in German it's das all. The universe is the everything. That's uh, very similar to the Greek. So his purpose is to unite everything, heaven and earth, everything. Now, if God's mission is to unite, what does that imply? It implies that things aren't united, that the universe is broken that the universe is separated and God wants to put it all back together again. So you see, Ephesians 1 gives us the core of God's mission to bring the universe back together, to reconcile all of his creatures, reconcile the entire universe back to God and to each other. That is the ultimate mission. That's what then the cosmic conflict is all about. There's a parallel text to Ephesians, sometimes called Paul's synoptic writing. Uh, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he sees everything together in Ephesians and in Colossians. And if you go through Ephesians and Colossians, you'll see they're talking about the same thing, uh, almost line by line. 
For in God's Son, it says in Colossians, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things. There's Tapanta again, the universe. He's going to reconcile the universe. It gives us an additional detail now. How will he do it? In Christ. Whether on earth or in heaven, there's that cosmic scope again, making peace by what? The blood of his cross. All right. So now we're getting a little more detail. We're seeing that this cosmic unity that God wants to bring about, he's going to do through Jesus Christ. It's, he's the tool through which God will do it. And Jesus does it through the cross. So here it tells us that the cross is more than just saving you and me. The cross is more than forgiving our sins. Sometimes that's what we talk about. Uh, I'm so glad for the cross because he forgave my sins. No, it's much, much bigger than that. The cross is the means by which he will reconcile the universe. So the cross has cosmic implications. Now, you remember I said when atonement isn't enough? Atonement is the word given to attempts to explain why did Jesus have to die. You know, that's, the church has never agreed on that. And by church, I mean the whole Christian church and the Adventist church. Adventist church has never agreed on that either. Why did Jesus have to die? You have a lot of different explanations, even in the New Testament. One of them is a sacrifice. A sacrifice was necessary somehow to reconcile people to God. Another one is ransom or redemption. We were, you know, taken away. We were held captive, and the cross somehow bought us back. Another one is a Greek word, hilasterion, that's very hard to translate. A couple of English words, propitiation, expiation. That really clears it up, doesn't it? <laughs> Even the English words, we're not quite sure exactly what they mean. But basically the idea there is that somehow there was a gap between us and God, and the cross filled that gap, and uh, now we're reconciled to God. Another explanation is we are all guilty in court. We've broken the law. We're guilty. We're sinners. Therefore, we need acquittal in the judgment. And through the cross, God acquits those who are guilty in the judgment. Another explanation is victory over sin and Satan and evil. At, at the cross, Christ defeated Satan and made it possible for him to be overcome in our lives. And then another one is why the cross because it reveals the character of God like nothing else could. So at the cross, the character of God is revealed. Another one is the cross is a model for how we should live. It teaches us how to live. And finally, the cross is a new covenant. Every one of these is taught by at least two New Testament authors. All right, that was my criterion for selecting these eight. It's got to be at least two New Testament authors that use that metaphor for the cross. And so all of these eight are clearly marked in the New Testament. New covenant is God made a covenant with Israel. If you obey me, all these good things are going to happen. Israel disobeyed. None of that good stuff happened. Then Jesus came, and he took our place, became Israel in relation to God. He obeyed where Israel failed, and in relationship to him, we can be restored to the covenant. You see, uh, that is, is one that I actually wrote a book on that uh, once called Meet God Again for the First Time. 
So in some ways, that's kind of my favorite. But the point is, all of these are in the New Testament. All of these have a purpose, and all of them have a shortcoming. But what do they all have in common? All of these have one thing in common, and that is what we could not do, God did. We couldn't make that sacrifice. God did. We couldn't ransom ourselves. God did. We couldn't make up for our broken law. God did. We couldn't defeat Satan. God did. We couldn't be a model for everyone to follow. God did. You see? So that's what they all have in common. But notice this. That's still self-centered. It's all about us. About my salvation. About my sin. About my shortcomings. About my guilt. You see? So the classic statements of atonement fall short of the text we just read in Ephesians and Colossians that the cross somehow reconciles the entire universe to God. In other words, the cross impacts not only those that sinned, it impacts those that never sinned. Impacts the entire universe, sinners or non-sinners. So the cross is bigger than perhaps anything we've imagined. It has cosmic implications. What more can we learn about this? Let's go to John chapter 12, where Jesus is talking about the cross. And here we get the first clear statement of a cosmic conflict of an enemy. Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. So Jesus points out here that there was an enemy claim to rulership of the universe. And that the cross was going to prove that that claim was faulty. Through the cross, the enemy claim to rulership of the universe would be denied. So here is the first clear statement that there's a war going on. There's an enemy out there who's in conflict with God. And tomorrow morning on Sabbath, we're going to talk about the biggest story ever told and focus specifically on that heavenly battle and uh, its implications for us. And there are some amazing implications so notice once again, Greek use, uh, Jesus uses this Greek word pantas here, or at least he's translated as using it. He's understood that the all people, ESV, says all people. It isn't really all people, it's everything. It's the universe that is going to be reconciled. And the reconciling of the universe happens when the evil one is cast down. So there's a war going on, and that war needs to be completed so that God can reconcile the entire universe. And what the cross tells us, if Jesus came down from heaven, if Jesus is God himself, if he's the word who made everything, who was with God in the beginning, who was God. If that's who this Jesus is, according to the Gospel of John, then God loves us more than himself. And by us, I mean the entire universe. All the planets, all the stars, all the creatures in this universe are only here because God made us. And God made us knowing that it was at least possible that it could all go wrong. And yet, back at the beginning, God said, if it goes wrong, I'll do what it takes. And that means that God 
loves us more than life itself. What kind of love does that? What kind of love loves another more than oneself? Paul explains a little bit of this in Philippians. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. That's the unity theme there. Remember, bring it all together. One mind, one love, full accord. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Paul offers a new definition of love. We have lots of definitions of love. We can love ice cream, you know. Some people love math. I don't understand that love, but some people do, you know. Uh, some people uh, love animals, etc. All kinds of definitions of love. But there's a new definition that comes in Jesus Christ. And it's a definition that treating others as better than yourself. Living for the sake of others. Notice, it says, have this mind in you which was in Christ Jesus. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus loved others more than his own life. That's a new definition of love. So Jesus said in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I loved you. How did Jesus love us? He loved us as the center of his focus. He was other-centered. So this is my understanding of the New Testament definition of love, that love is other-centeredness. Back in the beginning when there was no universe, God said, you know, we love one another here. And it's wonderful. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we had all kinds of creatures that we could love and that would choose to love us in return? So the very creation by God was expanding love, creating opportunities to be other-centered. When God created the world in Genesis 1, it was beautiful. It was perfect. And why did he do it? As a gift to Adam and Eve and thereby to us. Everything that God did was an expression of love. That is, I want the best for you even at cost to myself. And it cost God. Did you know that creation was a sacrifice? Every time God created a free being, someone who could choose, God was limiting his own choices. God was sacrificing himself because love is there for the benefit of the other. Love one another as I have loved you. Other-centered love. That is the key to unity in the universe. If everyone in the universe has as their focus the needs of others and caring for them, everyone will be cared for and all will be in harmony. It is only when selfishness comes in, when we start taking care of ourselves first, then everybody is wanting, everybody is needy, and then conflict happens, and the universe is broken. So other-centered love is the centerpiece of this universe. In contrast is Satan, because what you have here in this conflict is which form of government is the best for the universe? Is it a government founded in other-centeredness or is it a government founded on a different principle? And we see Satan's principle laid out in Revelation 13, where it says, by the signs that it, 
the earthly agent of Satan, is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And it causes all to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has a mark. What's happening here? You have Satan through earthly powers seeking to deceive, seeking to coerce, seeking to force behavior and exacting consequences if people don't. What kind of person deceives? It's somebody who would like to get something out of you, right? It's not you loving them. It's what they can get from you. And they deceive you because they know that if they told you the truth, you wouldn't go along. So it's a way of manipulating people to serve your needs instead of you serving them. So Satan is the opposite of God's character. Instead of other self-centered, it's self-centered. And when people don't do what you want them to do, what is the next temptation? Force. If you're not going to choose to do what I want you to do, I'm going to make you do it, and you're going to enjoy doing it. That's Satan's form of government, is to make people do what he wants them to do. That is not an other-centered approach. That is a self-centered approach. So you can see that Satan and God are laying out two ways to run the universe. And Satan is saying, my way is better. Because if everybody does it my way, the universe is going to be united and everything's going to be great. For me, at least. So Satan's authority is founded on lies and on force. In contrast, in the book of Revelation, is God's approach. He said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. You're familiar with programs like American Idol. Why do you use terms like that? for musicians or football stars or whatever. Worship is something you do when you hold someone in high esteem, when you truly admire them. That is what worship is all about. And God says that he desires our worship, our admiration, not because we have to, but because we choose to because we see his character and we truly want to be like that. So it is God's methodology, God's approach to invite us to understand him and admire him and thereby want to direct ourselves in his direction. Worship is simply learning to be other-centered toward God. And then in Revelation 14, 12, it says, the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God, and faith of Jesus. That translation isn't exactly perfect, but it's okay. The faith of Jesus. What is the faith of Jesus? What is faith? I find a lot of people aren't sure quite what faith is. But the best translation of the word faith is trust. It can mean a number of things in English, but trust is the one that seems to come closest to the biblical meaning. It's when you trust God. And Jesus trusted God. He lived by his words. He lived by his directions. And even on the cross, when God seemed absent, Jesus, in the end, said, to your hands I give my spirit. He trusted God to the end, even though he didn't 100% understand why these things were happening at that moment. And so he trusted, and, and the, the trust that Jesus had to God is the model for the trust. You trust somebody who proves themselves trustworthy. 
God does not demand our allegiance. He desires it that we would freely choose it on the basis of evidence of what he is like. When you come to know what God is like, then you're willing to trust God. That's how the cross reconciles the universe. Because at the cross, we see clearly the other-centered love of God, unlike anything that Satan can offer. And as we get to know that more and more, even the unfallen worlds, the angels that may have their doubts about God, when they saw the cross, they realized truly that what God said about himself was true. When God talks about love, he lives it. It's real. And our best possible life is found in God and in relationship to God. So God's approach fosters genuine admiration, love, and trust. Satan's approach demands and forces and deceives to get what he wants. The contrast between other-centeredness and self-centeredness. So the weapons in this cosmic conflict, according to the book of Revelation, on God's side, there's truth and persuasion. On Satan's side, there's force and deception. That's the contrast in the cosmic conflict. It is a war of words over the character and government of God. Truth versus deception and freedom versus force. What I want to do as we close, everybody who can get out your Bible, mine will be on my phone right here. I'd like to invite everyone to just take a look at uh, the scripture text. And the text that I've chosen here is in Matthew chapter 20. And I think this is the practical conclusion to what we've looked at tonight. What does it mean, this cosmic conflict? I mean, why should I care, right? How does it make a difference in my life? Jesus brings it home here in a very practical way. It says in Matthew 20, verse 20, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. Okay, what is the mother of Zebedee's sons going to ask him? He said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. What's she asking? I want uh, my two sons to be first vice president and second vice president of your kingdom. Is that other-centeredness? <laughs> How do you think the other disciples uh, worked with that? Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? In other words, he's saying that to govern the universe, one has to have a character of a certain kind. Otherwise, you become a tyrant. Most people can't handle power. You see what happens often with public figures. When they come in a position of power, they change. And they're not the person that they once were. Jesus says, you know, I'm going through this experience demonstrating the kind of character it takes to safely rule the universe. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. Jesus trusted his Father. And when the ten heard it, the other ten disciples, when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. You can imagine. But Jesus called to them and said, now what do you think he's going to tell them? What's the practical outworking of what we've just studied together? Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. 
the typical form of government exercising authority over people, uh, grasping the power, feeling the glory. That's what it's all about. And Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, Jesus came to show us what God is like. And he came as a servant. Think about that. The God of the universe came down, took human form, and lived his life as a servant. Why? Because that's how he wanted his disciples to live. He did not want them grasping the vice president positions. He did not want them to lord it over others in the church. But he said, I'm calling you to be like my father. I'm calling you to be like me because I came to serve and give my life for the good of others. So Jesus invites us to this incredibly difficult task, other-centered love. We can't do it on our own. We, we are ingrained selfishness with each one of us. But as we look to Christ, as we see what happened at the cross, as we discover what kind of love that God has showered on us, we can begin to taste more and more uh, of what that is like in our relationship with each other. Jesus left us an example that we should follow in his steps. And that's our part of this cosmic conflict. There's a battle within us between the natural selfish drive and the call of God's other-centered love, which we know in our hearts is a better way to live. And it is that conflict which is what matters today uh, in each of our lives, here in Seattle and around the world. Thank you, Dr. Pauline. Let's have prayer and then a few announcements for tomorrow. Dear Father in heaven, in this world that is full of conflict, you promise that we can have peace. Help us to reflect your character. And instead of thinking about what we can get, may we also, like you, seek others' interests even above our own and to think what we can give. Help us to reflect your character of love. In this world of trials and temptations, there is hardships, and probably people listening to this right now, even this year, have gone through some of them. So help us to continue to keep our eyes on you, to seek the hope and the promise that you give us, and we just pray a blessing to that end, and we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Tomorrow at 9.30... Dr. Pauline will continue with his lectures, and the 9.30 a.m. presentation will be about current issues in the church. So come live in person or watch on YouTube. And then the 11 a.m. worship service time will be the biggest story ever told. That's the title of the sermon. And then we'll wrap that all up in the afternoon at 1.30. So if you come in person, bring a sack lunch or grab a lunch, and then it'll be shortly after our, our worship service time at 1.30 for the final presentation. And then we'll have an opportunity for question and answer there as well. And we'll have a link for YouTube and Zoom. Thank you all for joining us in person and online. And we'll see you tomorrow. God bless.